Well, we have a topic to address that is uh, somewhat, I guess, a uh, difficult thing, um, something that we have to take to task and, and look at. And from time to time, this has to be done, that something is not right, something is not good, and it is gaining traction and has to be addressed. So that's uh, what we're going to do here. But we are also, of course, going to be looking at the scriptures together, um, at the positive statement of the Word of God for what ought to be. And um, I'm calling this lesson, Disclaimers Don't Deliver, which is to say when we get to the judgment day, you know, there's not somebody getting written into the Lamb's Book of Life with an asterisk, you know. <laughs> it's not going to work. You're, you're right with God or you're not. You know, there's not going to be... Uh, a disclaimer for what we do. We have to walk, you know, in the sunlight. We have to walk through the front door. We got to be what what we are and be honest. And so that has to be said. And so I want to put up this thing. I found among the churches that, uh, you know, most, not most, many of the churches now are following this idea of... Uh, what we would say are probably social aspects of life. Uh, as this website from one of the churches said, uh, food, games, singing, and fun. Uh, I guess singing could be spiritual. But um, it's, you know, I picked a specific site, and that's where I'm going to get this disclaimer from. We're going to look at this disclaimer together. But um, I don't mean to pick on that group particularly, it's just exemplary uh, or I guess typical of what uh, what's being seen out there now. You're finding that these, and it's non-institutional, um, you're finding this to be, you know, or I'm finding this to be representative generally of non-institutional churches who engage in the same thing. Um, more and more we're seeing this appeal to social activities, food and games, things like this, uh, under the guise of the religion of God, under the guise of spiritual things. And th these churches that, you know, historically didn't do this kind of thing, didn't mix the two, are starting to do so. And what you'll find almost invariably um, is exactly this kind of disclaimer. You know, they'll put something up, like this particular congregation did, they said, these activities, by the way, this, the activities, again, food, games, singing, and fun, and we had pictures of a bunch of people at a barbecue at a park together, and maybe some other things, I don't know if it was tag or confetti eggs or whatever. And it's not that I'm against having a good time or getting together, you know, and in fact, I think Christians probably should have more social interaction and know each other better so that we can help one another be influenced. That, that's fine. That's not what we're talking about. Um, what we're saying is this isn't something that's coming from God. It's not coming from the Bible that you do these things and that you uh, promote these things as the church. Um, but they were putting up this disclaimer that these activities are privately sponsored and funded by individuals who are invested in today's youth. Interesting. And then they said, although not the work of the church, we encourage participation because our teens find these associations with other Christians very spiritually uplifting. Hmm. So it is... The website of the church, that's the non-institutional church there in, uh, in that town, um, and not a small one, not one that doesn't have any influence. Um, no, I, I don't pick those. I don't pick on them. <laughs> I'm not picking on these people either, but this isn't like some scarecrow or uh, some straw man out there. Some cra you, know, you can always find somebody saying something crazy. That's not what we're doing here. This is very influential, very moneyed. Uh, the people are in circulation. Uh, the young men they train to preach get lots of meetings. Okay, 
That's why we're looking at this. But this is the disclaimer. Well, these activities, the food, games, singing, and fun, these are privately sponsored. Funded by individuals invested in today's youth. It's not the work of the church, we hasten to point out. But we do encourage participation. Our teens, apparently, have given feedback to the effect that these associations are very spiritually uplifting. So that is apparently the metric by which we have decided to go forth with this. And I has, I has some questions. I have questions about this. I have some questions about this, right? Uh, privately sponsored activities. My first question is, what does sponsor mean? <laughs> um is a sponsor a financial backer, like now a word from our sponsor? I think that's what they mean, financial backing. When they say privately sponsored, they mean that somebody gave the money from a uh, you know, private uh, entity or private origin. Or when they say a sponsor, is it like a, a, in, in your youth organizations, a leader or a conductor or a chaperone, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe it's one of those things. But really, you know, as I thought about this question, I thought, well, does it matter <laughs> whether it's the financial backing or whether it's adults in the room? Does it matter? Hmm. Well, I have to hold on to that thought. They said these things are privately sponsored and funded by people who are invested in today's youth. And then I realized... When I read the statement, well, sponsors, funding, investing, like why is all the talk here about money? Why is this about money? That's an odd thing. We're talking about the young people getting together for social activities, but somehow the disclaimer is pointedly fixated upon money. Why? Is it because we have argued ourselves into a corner about what money is for, about what money means in the local church? I dare say that's exactly what it's about. Why do they feel that they need to disclaim it? And in financial terms, well, I think it's because when they say it's funded, by individuals, or even if sponsor is talking about finances and it's a private sponsor, funded by individuals, private, individual, as opposed to what? Well, as opposed to the church treasury, right? That's what we're talking about. The reason they're talking about the money is because they're talking about the church treasury. Why can't the church treasury do it? Well, that's a different question, isn't it? But it seems like they're very much in a hurry to say the church isn't, isn't providing the funds. We're not using the church's funds. We're not using the Lord's money to do this. And I ask, you know, right out of the gate, well, why isn't your church invested in your young people? How about we just put it right back on you? Why isn't your church invested in your young people? It says here that there are individuals who are providing this, that it's not the work of the church, and that these people are invested in your young people. Well, why isn't the church invested in them? Why don't they care? Well, it's not that they don't, right? Okay. What is it then, exactly? Why, When we talk about funded by individuals, when we talk about investment in the youth Sponsoring something, you know. Is money really the dividing line between the work of the church and a work that is not being done by the church? It, that's determined by money? Like that's the only reason or the only thing? Is that really the, the dividing line? Is that how you know the difference? Is where the money comes from? The source? You know, it's an accounting trick. Hmm. I don't think there's a verse for that. I can think of no verse for that. Where's that coming from? 
I think it's, as we said above, we've argued ourselves into a corner. I think it's coming from debates and debate propositions and college professors. You know where it's not coming from? The Bible. The Bible. Aren't unpaid elders doing the work of the church? <laughs> if you don't pay your elders, even though the scriptures teach that we ought to, but if you don't pay them, and they're working on behalf of the church, you know, they come to visit you, they want to talk to you about your soul, or they want to pray over you because you're ill, you know, all of these fall within, within the realm of the work of the elders. The, the elders come and they're doing this and they're not being paid. Are they doing the church's work or not? And if they are doing it, then why, why is it being individually funded on the one hand? On the other hand, right? If it's not being funded by the church, doesn't that mean that it isn't a work of the church? And yet they're the elders and they're there in their official capacity doing the work of the church, regardless of how it's being paid for is my point. Does it matter who funds this? Does it matter who sponsors this? Does it matter what the origin of the funds is? The elders are doing the work of the church whether we pay them or not. When volunteers work for the church, are they working on behalf of the church? Are they doing it as a work that the church is doing? The church says we need people to do this. We have a widow who is in need. We need people to take to take food. We need people to cook for her. Help her, you know. Is that a work of the church? Yes, it is. First Timothy 5, very clearly the church is required to do this for faithful widows. Yes. If they're not being paid, they're volunteers. Is it a work of the church still? Yes. My point is, it's not about money, right? What is money about then? It's a work of the church whether, whether the church pays for it or not. That's what we're getting at. And why then are we fixated on the money? Well, besides the debates and, and, and the professors, why are we fixated on the money? What is it that commingling of funds actually does define? You know, when it comes down to it, what are we talking about? Is money the only truth? Is money the only way to know for real, for real what they believe and what they support and what they're doing and what they're engaged in? Is that, is that the only truth that there is, is the money? I don't think we like that situation, friends, because if you start looking at the money, you look at the money for real, for real money, that's not very good. Where is it going? What is it being spent on? Who is being supported by what? You won't like what you see when you lift that cover. What exactly is being determined by this, right? Now, as for these individuals who are invested in today's youth, you know, like I said earlier, why isn't the church invested in today's youth? What's wrong with the rest of you? It's only these people who go to trouble to care about the next generation, not the rest of you. What's the problem? Everybody else is neglecting them, I guess. Or maybe investing in today's youth is optional. I haven't read the prospectus, so maybe it's an optional thing. I'm not sure. I'm sure the operating fees are exorbitant. But really, do others neglect the young people? Is that what we mean by this? Let's not accuse people of not caring about the young because we're not spending, right? The other thing, whenever people talk about investing in today's youth, and you hear that all the time, you know, we care about the young people, we care. We have the youth lectureship, and we have the youth lecture series, and we have the youth uh, meetings, and we have the youth camps, and the youth, you know, everything for the youth. My question is always, what about today's older set? I just turned 50 not, not long ago. Um, and we had a lovely time, although I did receive a letter from AARP the next week, which I found kind of offensive, you know. Coming back from my mailbox, I was like, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
But uh, who's invested in today's older set? Right? Why the youth get all this? What about the rest of us? Which I say tongue in cheek, but truly, where are you going to find this? Well, the fact is you're going to find it in the denominations. That's where investment in the youth, that's where youth ministry came from to begin with, you know. And I, I pulled this one from um, the Baptist Church here in, in uh, Pflugerville. They have a group of retired fellows who volunteer, and their wives, who volunteer to build buildings for Baptist churches, Baptist entities. It says they volunteer their time. The retirees travel at their own expense to donate their services. You know, it says, join us and put your retirement years to work for Christ. You will be working with experienced men and women in a Christian atmosphere. But again, you travel at your own expense. It's interesting to me because I'm seeing, well, yeah, they are the ones who came up with the youth ministries to begin with, the Baptist church, really. They're the ones that came up with that and the devotionals. That's where that came from. You don't read about the word devotional in the Bible. That came from the Baptist. Um, and if you look there, they're well on their way to the older set and the care for the older set. So my question for the church there and any church that participates in these things, when is retiree week? When is the old folks lectures? You know, when are we going to have the old settlers reunion? And if not, why not? Because my question follows on the rest of that disclaimer. They said their young people, you know, the church there encourages participation because the young people say these associations are spiritually uplifting to them. Okay, at what age do associations cease to be spiritually uplifting? How old do you have to be before this is no longer uplifting in the spirit? Or maybe you just reach an age where spiritual uplifting is not useful to you. You don't need to be uplifted in the spirit, you think? Eh, wrong. That's not what it is. That's not what it is, right? I'm not, you're not fooling anybody. That's what we're saying. You're not fooling anybody. It's privately sponsored, though, the youth report that it's spiritually uplifting, spiritually uplifting. Let me ask you, why do you have to have private sources for something that is spiritual? Why does that have to be done by private funds? Why the deflection along financial lines? If it's spiritually uplifting, why isn't it the work of the church? If it's spiritual, if it benefits the Lord's people, why does the church not do it? Under what guise can we say, hey, uh, the church can't do this thing that's spiritual in nature and uplifting to the saints? Oh, they said it's not a work of the church. Remember that one? What a whopper. But it's on the church's website. It's in the announcements. It's in the bulletin. You got photos of your members on the website there doing this thing together. You called it spiritually uplifting. How's that different from whatever else the church does? Just the source of the money? We've already established that the money is not the determining factor as to whether it's a work of the church or not. The elders who work as volunteers are nonetheless doing the work of the church and they're nonetheless authoritative in the Lord. Not a work of the church, but we do encourage participation, they said. Isn't, you have a frog in your pocket, <laughs> as they say? Ain't, isn't we the church? It's you. The church encourages participation. Well, when the church encourages you to participate in a work, isn't that a work of the church? Did you notice they said our young people 
report that these associations with other Christians are spiritually uplifting. I thought associations with other Christians was an odd phrase. Odd phraseology. What do you mean by association? Do we mean social, not spiritual gatherings? Do we mean friendships? Do we mean the dreaded interpersonal relationships from your resume? <laughs> if they're social associations, how are they spiritually uplifting? Mm hmm. Now oh, you're down to it, right? Isn't this congregation just trying to distance themselves from the clearly social activities that they're engaged in? Yeah. That's, of course, what they're doing. And that's what the lesson is about. The disclaimers don't deliver. You can put all the disclaimers you want to, you're still doing it. Now, when you look at the Bible together here, look with me at the Bible on this. You got 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3. I think it's the single best summary I appreciate your patience in considering those things with me, but I, and again, the reason for looking at that in such detail is that it's representative of what I'm seeing among the non-institutional churches. But what do we have in common? First John chapter one and verse three. Let's go back to the Bible. It says the apostle said that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. The apostles said, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you also may have fellowship with us. Fellowship is the thing that is held in common. What do we have in common with the apostles? It's what they have in common. As he said, indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It's what they have in common with the Father and with the Son. What do we have in common with the apostles? They're not from America. <laughs> they're not from, they're not around today. They're not even from the 1900s, as my teenager says. Um, what do we have in common with them? It's clearly the spiritual teaching that they did what they proclaim about Jesus, what they teach about the Lord. And that is a thing they hold in common with the Father and with the Son, Jesus, that Jesus came to earth and gave forth this teaching, and the apostles are good and useful only insofar as they faithfully discharge that word of God. See Galatians, where Paul has to rebuke Peter for not being straightforward about the inclusion of the Gentiles. Galatians 2. Now, what we have in common is something that is spiritual. It is not social. We don't share a nation. We don't share an identity, a, a culture, a tongue, an experience. We share the spiritual with the apostles, with the Father, and with the Son, if we do that. We never met the apostles we never met the Lord. A social interaction with them is not even possible. We couldn't have something social in common with them. And even Paul said this in his second letter to Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5, you know, where he said, you know, in, in the big picture there, he's saying, look, we... Sometimes things don't go well here. And even if we lose our life or our position in this life, we have a home in the heavens not made with hands. We walk by faith and not by sight. We want to be pleasing to God. And, and he says in this context, in the 16th verse of 2 Corinthians 5, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once knew Christ according to the flesh, we know him thus no longer. They knew Jesus in the body, they actually knew him, had a real, genuine, personal relationship with Jesus and said, that is former. We used to know him that way. We don't know him in that way anymore. 
So even if we had known Jesus in the flesh the way the apostles did, we would still be bound by what Paul says. That, no, he is the king of kings. Now, um, let's chase this down fairly quickly. In 1 Kings 22, turn your attention to 1 Kings 22 for the first part of this. But what we have here is an example of a failed disclaimer. Disclaimers have been tried. And, you know, I'm sure I've picked the most obtuse and difficult to follow example because uh, that's what I do. I, you know, <laughs> I don't have good common sense. Uh, you know, sorry. Get your own lesson. The first Kings 22, we're looking at Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat had a failed disclaimer. It's recorded there, beginning there, the 48th verse of 1 Kings 22. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, but they did not go, for the ships were wrecked at Ezion Geber. Then Ahaziah, son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with your servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat was not willing. It's just these two verses. And it's a little subtle. But look again. Jehoshaphat made ships. And they were going to go, there were ships of Tarshish going to Ophir for gold, but they didn't go because they were wrecked at Ezion Geber. Now, the question is, who made the ships? Well, it says Jehoshaphat made ships, that's true. Who wrecked the ships? Well, it just says they were wrecked. Hmm. So Jehoshaphat is making boats to go get gold. They get wrecked. They don't go to gold. They don't go get gold. They wreck. Then at 49 of 1 Kings 22, Ahaziah, son of Ahab. Who's that? That's the king of Israel. Not the king of Judah. Jehoshaphat's the king of Judah. The Israel, the Israel state says to him, let my servants go with yours. Which means his servants weren't in the ships with Jehoshaphat's servants. Right? They built the ships. The ships wreck. Ahaziah says, my guys can help. And Jehoshaphat's not willing to do that. Notice what is happening. Jehoshaphat is ever so careful about the terms of this engagement. He's going to build ships. They're going to go get gold. And the ships are not going to have any servants of the king of Israel on them. Why did he do that? He did that to make a separation. He's deliberately excluding the servants of the king of Israel from the ships. And when he tried to do it on his own, and he couldn't do it without potentially including a crew that came from Israel, he abandoned this. They didn't do it again. That is what 1 Kings 22 tells us happened, but it doesn't tell you why. That's what Chronicles is for. But it tells you that's what happened. Jehoshaphat is deliberately excluding the king of Israel's servants from the boats. Why? Well, the record is in 2 Chronicles 20. Same event, but the perspective, the spiritual perspective that Chronicles always provides gives you the rest of the story. To quote Harvey. All right, so 2 Chronicles 20, verses 35 to 37. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, joined with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted wickedly. He joined him in building ships to go to Tarshish. And they built the ships in Ezion Geber. Then Eliezer, son of Dodovahu, 
of Marashah prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have joined with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. And the ships were wrecked, not able to go to Tarshish. That's what happened. Jehoshaphat tried to make a separation, but that separation evaporated in the eyes of God, in the scrutiny of the Lord. It is recorded very plainly for us, verse 36 of 2 Chronicles 20, or even 35, I'm sorry, Jehoshaphat joined with Ahaziah, king of Judah, joined the king of Israel who acted wickedly. And 36, he joined him in building ships to go to Tarshish. So where the king said, Jehoshaphat built these ships, and they wrecked at Ezion Geber, and the king of Israel volunteered to have his servants join on the boats this time for a second attempt, and Jehoshaphat wasn't willing to do that. Okay. But here is the rest of the story. The fact is, there wasn't a real separation. It was pretend. He thought they were separated. But the Lord said in his word, you have joined with Ahaziah. You joined him in building boats. And in fact, the prophet said, you have joined with Ahaziah. Therefore, the Lord will destroy what you have made. The word of the Lord is, he joined him. That's why the ship's wrecked. And I, it reminds me of 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 19, where, where Paul tells Timothy, wage the good warfare, holding faith and a clean conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Jehoshaphat didn't have a clean conscience. He knew he shouldn't be joining hands with Ahaziah, king of, Judah, of Israel. He knew that was wrong, so he tried to make a separation by keeping his, servant, his servants as the only ones on the boat. You know what that means? Right? It means he thought he could get away with a joint venture with the king of Israel as long as he made sure that the crew of the ship were entirely his own servants not servants of Israel. Why? Because then it would be privately sponsored and individually funded. That's why. Did it work? No. No. You're not fooling anybody. He thought there would be no commingling of funds. And that would make it clean. It did not. The Lord said... In the scripture, Jehoshaphat joined with Ahaziah. The Lord said through the prophet to the king, to his face, you joined with Ahaziah. Who is right? God is right. God is right. That disclaimer, that's not fooling anybody. You're doing it. Doesn't matter where the money comes from. You're doing it. The real question is not about, you know, the use of the treasury, the autonomy of the local congregation, which doesn't actually exist. You know, we're not self-ruled. Jesus is the king. This is a monarchy. We don't rule ourselves. Jesus rules us. And I don't have anything to do with any of that stuff. It has to do with what are you doing and why are you doing it? And so in Hebrews 4, we close with this thought in the 12th and 13th verses about the judgment of God, because disclaimers don't deliver in the day of judgment. That's just how it's going to be. There won't be an asterisk next to the name of anybody in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's not how it's going to work. If we're doing this, if we feel the need to distance ourselves from it, we should listen to that conscience before we suffer shipwreck. And Hebrews 4 says plainly, 12 and 13, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts 
and the intentions of the heart. It gets right down to it, every last detail. It doesn't matter how, how good our plan is, <laughs> how you know, exquisitely negotiated our engagement has been. That just doesn't matter. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. There's no hiding from God. There's no hiding from our intent. God reads the heart. God knows what we are doing and why we are doing it. So we're not just talking about throwing young people off of the bus that, or under the bus. That, that's not what I'm saying. If that's what you're taking from this, I'm sorry. Try again. You know, let's back up a little bit. That's not what we're talking about. What we're saying is, friends, what are we doing and why? And where is the Bible for that? And why are we going to leave the boundaries of what God has prescribed for us in his word? to do other things besides his with resources that belong to him. It's not just the money that belongs to him, you know, although it does, and we give our money, but it's no longer our money when we give it. Now it's God's money. <laughs> the treasury belongs to him. But it's not just the treasury. We're borrowing this air that we're breathing, you know. The rain that brought forth the produce that we consumed this morning for breakfast. All right the time that we're living on. like This all belongs to God. We're using his resources. What are we using them for? Are you ready for the judgment? It is about honesty, clarity, straightforwardness. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourselves. Be honest with the world. Let people know that you are well, no, not perfect, but you're honest and humble and listening. You're looking at the scriptures to see what should it be. Well, today, if you're not a Christian, be honest with God and yourself. Become a Christian. Become a child of God. Repent. Accept that I've been wrong about this. I was wrong about God. I was wrong about his word. I'm going to make things right. I'm going to be reconciled to him. Turn over a new leaf, a new, a new life in God. Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Be buried together with him in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Be raised together with him to newness of life, to good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, verse 10. We have water prepared that you might obey the gospel. Today, are you a Christian who has, a, or you're not a Christian who, who has not been doing what ought to be done? Repent. Pray God for forgiveness, as Simon the sorcerer had uh, been told to do in Acts chapter 8. We'll pray with you and for you too. Uh, tough things to think about here, but it is about honesty, it's about integrity. We're not going to fool God in the judgment. We've got to be clean, and we've got to do it now. It's time to wake up. It's time to walk in the light. It's time to be reconciled to the Lord. If you need the prayers of the saints, you need to be baptized. Let it be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected.